Yay! Yay. <laughs> what is up, everyone? Welcome to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 322. After 321 episodes, you would have thought we had the audio figured out? No. Turns out something happens almost every week. Every week, some <laughs> some little gremlin in the computer uh, decides to get a little finicky. It's Gus. Uh, yes, that's exactly what it is. Welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 322. We have an exciting episode today, an exclusive, if you will. I don't know. Uh, we've got Dylan <laughs> Bowman is going to be joining us on the show tonight to chat about his very recent Wonderland fastest known time, the Wonderland Trail that runs around Mount Rainier. Um, so we have a lot to cover in tonight's show. We're just going to dive right, up, right on in. So welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, episode 322. The show begins now. Ginger Runner. Yay! Yay! How are you? Great. Great. Welcome, everyone, to Ginger Runner Live, episode number 322. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy Mondays to spend a little bit of it with us. Uh, very exciting show tonight. The chat room's already fired up. Uh, no doubt. Uh, people get, like, stoke-level rives rises when we talk about <laughs> fastest known times and, and things that are happening right now. But the Stoke level rises to a new level whenever we have Dylan on. True. Dylan's kind of like legendary uh, on Ginger Runner Live. He's been one of our, he was one of our first guests. He's been on the show a number of times over the years. Um, just an all around talented ultra runner athlete. One of the kindest, nicest, most humble guys out there. Uh, just a stellar athlete. And it's been really cool to see his, his career just explode. He's been running ultras for close to a decade now and uh, just absolutely shredding. I, I was going to say, as he says it, I don't think you he says that. You sound so cool when I you think say I, it. I think I try to sound cooler <laughs> when I talk to Dylan because Dylan's so cool that I'm just like, I want to be cool too. Shred, shred. Shred. Look, these words I don't normally use. Shred. <laughs> Nar. And it just makes me feel like an idiot. Very uh, cool. Very, very cool. So tonight's show, we are featuring Dylan Bowman. We're going to talk to him all about his recent Wonderland FKT. The Wonderland is a 93-mile trail that goes around Mount Rainier. One of the Pacific Northwest's probably like uh, hidden, I'm going to say hidden gem, but it's not iconic. hidden. <laughs> iconic <laughs> trails. And probably kind one of, of the, the most. like opposite of hidden gem. <laughs> the complete opposite. It's, it's literally very, not hidden. It's pretty well known. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, the movie that I made years ago, about five years ago. What followed Gary Robbins around uh, the Wonderland Trail when he set the fastest known time at that time. So we're going to kind of get into maybe uh, some of the weeds here as far as fastest known times and maybe some specifics with times uh, when we introduce Dylan. Um, but be, of course, before we do, it's not just myself and our wonderful guest, Dylan, who we'll introduce here in a second. It is also the wonderful Kim. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Hi, everybody. Kim Tashima Newberry here, as always. If you're new, welcome. Uh, we will be bringing Dylan on live in just a second. So because we have him here, if you have questions for him, just pop them into the chat room. I know there's a bunch of you guys already talking. Uh, some people hit the Wonderland Trail the day after Dylan got off yeah. of it. Some people are hitting it this weekend. So I think the buzz in the chat room is, is hi. Hi. Hi, <laughs> Buzz. Um, yeah, it, we've gotten lots of emails from people who knew that that I was down there filming and Dylan was there running while he was doing it. Yeah, we didn't really like I I didn't say I was filming anything and Dylan didn't announce he was doing it until basically the day before. Uh, so many people didn't know about it until it was happening. And they're like, oh, I was going to be on the Wonderland tomorrow, that sort of thing. Uh, so before we introduce our guests, just some uh, final thank yous uh, to our wonderful crew for making this show possible. Our GR crew, as we like to call them, um, basically make Ginger Runner Live, all of our reviews, these movies, they are the reason that these things happen. Uh, and if you would like to join the GR crew, it's very easy to do. You just got to go to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a dollar a month. You support everything that we do here. And it's a fantastic community of people, all abilities, all uh, 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 levels of runners and athletes and stuff like that. So it's a really, really amazing community. One individual in particular at that top tier, we like to recognize at the top of every Ginger Runner Live because he's he's so enthusiastic and inspiring brian sands just yes. a wonderful human being and he's done so much for this community for other runners out there he ran his first marathon at the age of 50 his first 50k that same year uh he's on this incredible planning journey. some big things currently planning, planning big, to run big the things. cocodona 250 next year uh, so brian is just a wonderful human so thank you brian and thank you <laughs> gr crew for making this possible without further ado <laughs> Probably one of the athletes in this sport that I look up to the most, purely because of his style, his kindness, his generosity, and just kind of 
humble nature. Like he's not out there like, look what I did. He's very much the, I hope I can do great things, uh, but I also want to bring people along for the ride at the same time. Without further ado, Dylan Bowman. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys. So you're, dude, you're coming to us from your studio because this is this is something you do now, right? Podcasting. Yeah. And- you can see my extremely entertaining wall behind me. This is a <laughs> professional backdrop. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I have uh, my own little office here in Portland. And uh, you can see I have some technology um, in a mic and some headphones. So hopefully that improves the audio. But yeah, it's good to see you guys after... What a couple of days of uh, rest and relaxation back at home. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I feel like uh, Dylan is definitely a contender for the top uh, best audio quality. I also feel like you need some pictures of your dogs or something behind you on that wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do need to definitely hang up some decorations in here. It's it's uh, pretty plain, but uh yeah, that's uh, my major weak point is anything aesthetic or interior decorating related. I, I leave that to uh, my lovely wife, Harmony, who has made our house uh, really nice. And she hasn't yet turned her attention to my office yet. So we'll, we'll <laughs> right. put that on her to-do list. Yeah, uh, I feel like we can kind of start there as far as uh, your new place. You were living in a new city and stuff like that. Uh, just before we get into that. I want to recognize that we're going to talk to Dylan about the Wonderland FKT tonight. And uh, are, are you stressed right now, Dylan? I want to just start there because there's also <laughs> a, a local runner who is currently attempting to better even your time, which is which is crazy. So this is happening in yeah. real time right now. Are you how are you feeling just even sitting down and talking to us right now? I mean, it's all good. Obviously, uh, I would have hoped the record lasted longer than than five days. Um, but, you know, this is the nature of 2020. Everybody's setting their own sort of personal projects. And the Wonderland is no doubt one of the most worthy of those, especially here in the Northwest. And Tyler Green, who's a friend and uh, sometimes training partner, is out there right now. And it seems that he is running really strong. So uh, it could be, I have a feeling that uh, he's going to be successful in taking that record down this evening. There's still, you know, several hours to go for him. Uh, But if so, you know, it it couldn't happen to a better guy. And uh, that would give him the record on all three of the proud volcanoes here in the Northwest and Hood, St. Helens and Rainier. So he's uh, through White River at this point. And he's, I think, just a little bit ahead of my pace and, uh, right out of White River. I had a really tough section. So um, my guess is he'll probably make up some time there and we'll see if he can hold it to the finish. Yeah, this will be interesting to sort of follow in real time. And another reason why I really wanted to talk to Dylan today is because the standard he set less than a week ago is mind blowing. I mean, I just pictured the emoji of the head exploding and that's basically <laughs> what I felt. All week. So as promised, I kind of want to start back with your move to the Northwest. So you and your wife moved back to uh, or moved to Portland, Oregon. And uh, how has that been? What was sort of the draw to the Northwest? And and how did you end up up here in this beautiful left up corner of the U.S.? Well, I don't want to talk it up too much because I don't want more people to move here. (laughs) uh, I've been just so thrilled and happy with uh, how we felt since arriving here. It's already been almost 11 months, almost a year since we arrived Mm -hmm. last October. And uh, yeah, to give you sort of the abbreviated version of our thought process, we were living in California for a long time. Obviously, you guys were too. And as we all know, it can be a little bit of a rat race there, especially when you're starting to get into your 30s and starting to think a little bit more long term and not a multimillionaire. And so we were facing that situation too. And, um, my wife was in a position where she was ready to leave her job and start a company. And I was going to be going to Colorado to train for a summer. This is all the way back in 2018. So Mm -hmm. we went to Colorado for a short bit, but that was never really going to be our long-term destination. My wife grew up here in Portland and it was really always kind of like our intention, I think, to land here eventually Uh, We did spend longer than expected in Colorado, about a year and a half. And then uh, we came here to Portland, like I said, last October. We bought a house in January. We're, you know, um, really thrilled to be here. Been really enjoying doing all the training, exploring all these uh, wonderful places up here. And 
uh, honestly, I think it's a really well kept secret. I mean, I think it's an underrated place to train and adventure. And um, Mount Rainier is just one example of amazing things to do in our neighborhood. So we've been really, really happy. And um, yeah, you know, hopefully with um, the, the, um, the sort of toning down of COVID, hopefully in the near future, we'll have more of an opportunity to connect more with the community. Obviously that's been impacted a bit. Um, I've been able to connect with some local runners, but certainly not to the degree that I'd like to. So sure. that's a short story of it. Uh, but again, we're really happy to be here. It's one of those things uh, now living in the Northwest for a number of years, having grown up here, moved away, moved back. When you get word that someone like Dylan is moving to the Northwest or people who you really admire mm -hmm. like Dylan, uh, it's such a it's such a cool thing uh, for us because we want to show off this region so much. I can only imagine it's the same for local uh, Portland runners. Um, I can how many have reached out even despite COVID and been like, dude, I got to take you on this route or this route or I got to show you <laughs> this mountain. Like, have you got a chance to really explore the region and see just what is here? Yeah, of course, everybody's been very friendly and um, I've gotten a few sort of like stop and chats on the trail, people telling me welcome to town and, you know, people who are, you know, exceedingly friendly, giving me compliments about the things that I've accomplished in my career and, you know, saying it's good to have you in the neighborhood type of thing. And yeah, like you said, it's been great to get beta from uh, people on different routes and adventures nearby um, Tyler, who we've just talked about, who's out there right now, he and I have gone on a, a few cool ones and he's sort of pointing me in the direction of, of other worthy adventures. And, um, yeah, it's so again, like, um, the, the whole community aspect I know is, is pretty strong here in Portland, which is really important to, to us and something that we had, um, really strongly in the Bay area when we lived there. And, yeah what something we didn't have in uh in colorado just like a, a community of other athletes and so um again yeah lo really looking forward to the time when it's a little bit easier to rendezvous not only for big group run but also a beer afterwards and uh obviously racing too so it's been great yeah it's one of those things that makes the northwest so I guess kind of stand out is just that community aspect and and yeah being able to go grab a beer afterwards and stuff and Man, it's something that we truly miss uh, during this pandemic. <clears throat> and I, and also, I, of course, like the races and stuff. Like when we see yeah. you moving up here, we're also seeing Chris and Jenny on their way to move up here. And we're just like, we can't wait to see uh, people like yourselves take on some of the local races here just to see what kind of excitement can go down. <laughs> when they can happen. <laughs> when uh, they know, can happen. Yeah, Portland exactly. and Oregon, some of the race directors there have just incredible routes. Uh, we've got Tiger Claw. There's the Cascade, Cascade Crest, Crest and Tiena, like all these yeah. huge races that we we look at and go, how is this not one of the biggest races in the world? Like, right. how is this not bigger? And bringing people like Dylan uh, is just going to make this whole scene bigger and bigger and bigger. So we yeah, love having well, you up here, man. We should probably say for the Pacific Northwesterners who are maybe listening to us now, you know, we're we're sorry for. Uh, blowing the cover and uh we, we promise not to recruit too many more californians who are really <laughs> really suffering with the um with this wildfires and things right now too and i know that happens here as well but yeah it's it's i think really underrated and you know like the whole weather thing i haven't found it to be uh or i found that to be overrated too i've really enjoyed the uh the climate here and uh yeah i mean the last two months have been absolutely perfect here and actually looking forward to some rain here in the next couple of months but <laughs> the weather is the secret that we don't want to get out that's the, yeah, yeah. Every, everyone's like oh man it rains in the northwest it's terrible here it rains all the time it's like, terrible yeah, yeah, it's terrible yeah, don't move yes. stay out uh, we love the rain that's why we moved here um so yeah let's let's dig a little bit on on last wednesday's attempt so what drew you to the Wonderland Trail? That one specifically, it has a lot of history. There's, I mean, the time that Gary set that then Gelfie bettered, those are stout freaking time. So like what drew you to that route, that line, and uh, why now? Well, I think, you know, being a long-term participant in the sport, you can't help but like learn about the Wonderland Trail at some point. And for me, I've been in the sport for more than a decade at this point. And when I first sort of learned about ultra running, I found 
a lot of inspiration from other kind of like younger athletes on the scene at the time I was in my early twenties, I was like 22. And so like a lot of people at that time, uh, we were really inspired by people like Anton Krupichka and Kyle Skaggs. And I remember when, uh, this is back in 2008 or so, when I first learned about what ultra running was that I heard about Kyle Skaggs doing the Wonderland trail and setting the fastest known time. And at that point, Kyle was somewhat of a legendary figure because he had set the course record at the hard rock 100 in a time that at that point, I think nobody had been within three or four hours of. So he was kind of an iconic legendary figure in the sport and hearing about the Wonderland trail at that point kind of planted a seed, but it wasn't until the last few years that I actually, um, and like kind of actively thought about going for it. Like I knew I would want to do it at some point in my career, maybe not necessarily as a speed record attempt, but at least in a single or multi-day push. And, um, of course your video with Gary was a big motivator there. And then, yeah. So after Gary did it and then Gelfie broke it a couple of years later, I had reached out to Gary and said, Hey, I just saw Gelfie broke, uh, broke your record. Now that, uh, he's got it. Would you mind maybe sharing a little beta? Cause I'm thinking about going for it too. And this is back in 2018 and, um, I never got around to it that year. And then all of last year I was injured. And so of course, you know, moving to Portland this year and, having all the races canceled, it became the perfect objective for me. It's something I've wanted to do my entire career Mm. and, um, something that was close to home and with hard rock being canceled again and, you know, really no proper racing in the foreseeable future. Uh, it was a really fun project to devote my time and attention to this summer. So yeah, it was a decade in the making and went by in the blink of an eye. I, a blink of an eye is, is like the thing is is that's so accurate it was you were done so fast and we'll get to this later this is one of those things where i'm like i don't want to start getting too much into what actually ended up happening but let's just say it was really difficult to even keep up with you driving around the mountain uh that's how fast you were moving um again we are live with dylan bowman uh kim is pulling questions out of the live chat room if you have anything you want to ask of our wonderful guest tonight about the fkt or about running or training right now in, in, in the pacific northwest drop into the chat room let us know we'll pull a couple of sites we'll get to one of those in just a second because i just wanted to uh briefly touch on um injury and sort of what you've been dealing with in the last year we had you up here in the northwest in seattle for that wonderful talking series with you, Ellie Greenwood, Gary Robbins, and you got to touch a little bit on that, but our um, viewing audience maybe doesn't know a lot of what happened in the last year. So just getting to the start of this FKT was a long journey for you. Do you mind touching a little bit on on that and how you got here healthy? Sure, yeah. So, of course, everybody who's watching this knows that injuries are a part of sport and especially a part of running, but I've been really, really lucky in my career to really never deal with any serious injury. And that goes back to even before I was a runner, when I played lacrosse, I never missed a practice, let alone a game due to injury. I've just always been durable and and lucky with my health. And 2019, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. At least that's how it seemed to me. And just to give you kind of like the year in a nutshell in January, I went to the Hong Kong 100 K hoping to start my season there. I picked up a bad travelers bug and that ultimately forced me to drop out of the race. Um, and then shortly thereafter, I got crazy sick again before another race in, in March. And I sort of chalked it up to another bit of bad luck or whatever. Um, but then, yeah, as I was getting ready for trans Volcania last April, the race was going to be happening in May. I was coming out to Portland to do uh, a little training camp to get out of the snow in Colorado. And on my first day of training camp, I was coming down Mount Defiance, took just uh, a step just the wrong way and, and broke my left ankle, uh, pretty seriously as an avulsion fracture in my left ankle. Uh, didn't require surgery or anything like that, but it was really bad and uh, took a, a long time to recover from, of course, because I had never really had experience or, um, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, experience with injury and, and the maturity that comes with it. Uh, I was really undisciplined in my return. I forced it for a long time, ended up developing other injuries as a result just from compensation 
most notably, I had some really bad Achilles tendonitis and eventually it got to a point where my body was like, okay, you really can't run anymore. And at that point, I really would have had a perfect opportunity to, to stop and get myself healthy and listen to the signals my body was giving me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but instead, I decided to go out for a long bike ride, crash my bike, separated my shoulder, got a concussion, put me on the shelf again for another long time. So, um, yeah, it wasn't until, you know, that happened that I really took the, um, the lesson of like, dude, you really need to stop. Like clearly something, the universe is trying to tell you something right now. There's something else that you need to be paying attention to. And so I spent the, the latter part of 2019, um, yeah, getting my body back in order, but more importantly, getting like my internal life back in order, getting my emotional self back in order. We moved to Portland and, um, that I think was causing a lot of, um, underlying anxiety for me, just like feeling unattached to Colorado, having left California, not really knowing where home base was. I think that kind of just left me feeling untethered and is the only way I can think to describe it. And I think because I was so out of balance internally, I was just more prone to have these injuries happen. And so, um, luckily I, I was able to, uh, get that under control and, um, and then get connected with a really good physical therapist here in Portland who, who put me back together. And, uh, I went back, raced again at the beginning of the year. I won a little 50 miler in Southern California, the Sean O'Brien 50, and that was leading up to trans grand Canaria, which I did in March and uh, finished third there. So it was great to kind of be back on the podium in a big race after a full year of uh, really not feeling like myself. And uh, the momentum has just kind of been building since then. I've been feeling better and better. And um, yeah, I can say that uh, I'm as close to 100% that I've been in two years. So it was a long road, but um, yeah, it uh, takes patience and diligence, but uh, it does have a way of coming around. It's interesting because I feel you're not the first athlete that we've talked to on the show who's who's dealt with a similar sort of shift in something, uh, whether it's injury that that puts you on this path and kind of starts you that that direction, but somehow comes full circle after a year or longer and sort of finds this new self that that was much needed in sort of reinvigorating their connection with the sport, with the love of running, or or just with challenging themselves. So I mean your journey helped a lot of people. I remember when you were talking about this at our um, event, you could just see the audience was a lot of people don't know that you went through all this. There's a lot of stuff that you really opened up about even just here uh, in your answer. Um, So I think a lot of people connected with this Mm -hmm. to think like an elite can go through this, the same sort of mental stuff and and injury that I go through. It, it really kind of helps put in perspective that they might be going through something and they're not alone in it. And people like Dylan can also go through this. Um, sorry. Oh, I was going to say you were you were listing off all these things that kind of went wrong, and it totally it totally slipped my mind. The bike accident. I had forgotten about the bike accident too, dude. Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah. Those are. I mean, I ugh, rough, dude. Crashing yeah. a bike. I can't. Ugh. That was the Scary. rock bottom moment. Yeah, it was a. Uh, it was pretty terrible to to call Harmony and say you're not going to believe this, but I need you to pick me up and take me to the hospital again. <laughs> She's like, you can't be serious, you idiot. I need you so, to pick uh, me up in prison. Uh, yeah. I did some bad things. I mean, as uh, as unfortunate as it was, it was totally necessary at the time, and I probably would still be beating my head against a wall if it hadn't happened. So. Sure. Yeah, I think uh, everybody can identify with that. Adversity is something we all learn from, and it's hard to see the value of it in real time. But with a little perspective, uh, you can always kind of grow and improve from those experiences. Um, Again, we are live with Dylan Bowman. Kim, what do we got? Yeah, first, just a comment from Raul in the chat room. Raul says the fact that Dylan has had so many injuries and setbacks lately is really inspiring. And a lot of people in the chat room just echoing um, that they can relate or that they feel inspired from this. Uh, And then a question from Ryan in the chat room. Ryan says, did you get out and scout or run any of the route beforehand on the Wonderland? Uh, I did a fast packing trip a few summers ago and was surprised at how much navigation was required for such an iconic trail. Yeah, this is a really good question. And I think something that uh, some people will be able to learn from. And, you know, in in my case, of course, like this was the focus of my entire summer. I approached it just like I would any other race. And 
one of the things that leads to success in these types of ad- objectives is course knowledge. Uh, that goes for, you know, whether you're doing Western States or UTMB or Leadville or any other race, you're going to do better if you know what's ahead of you and what to expect in almost all circumstances. And especially for FKTs, I think it's even more important because you're dealing with water filter, you're we're dealing with different water sources. Um, yeah, you don't want to, in the middle of your FKT, to have to stop and pull out your phone and look at Gaia to make sure you're going the right way. So uh, for me, it was really important to come out and see the trail prior to my FKT attempt. And because, like I said, we live in Portland, we're only two, two and a half hours away from the mountain. And so three weeks ago, or I guess three weeks before my attempt, so about four weeks ago, we came out, Harmony and I, and did a three-day lap around the mountain. She kind of drove around, did her own adventures, and I did um, the full Wonderland Trail over three days. And that was really critical for me, not only for a training stimulus, for having three really big days back to back to back, uh, which is really helpful for something like the Wonderland, um, but also, like I said, for the navigation for understanding where the hard parts were, where the technical parts were, the parts that I was probably going to be doing in the dark, where the water sources are, where the crew stations are, all those things were incredibly important for me to have that, you know, pre-knowledge going in. So those whole three days, I was just trying to download as much as I could the whole time. And, um, I think that, uh, course knowledge really, you know, paid off for me, um, last Wednesday, I never had to get my phone out once, you know, I was never confused at any of the trail junctions. And, you know, I think now that the record is, is a lot lower, it's going to, it's going to take that kind of course knowledge, I think, um, for anybody to break it. I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that because it sounds a little bit arrogant, but like somebody like Jim Walmsley could come out. He has enough talent. He could do it, you know, tomorrow off the couch probably. But for the vast majority of, of people, um, it's the type of trail that, I mean, it's such a long day and uh, it's a big commitment. So if you're going to be trying to do it and going for a record, you're going to want to do it right, in my opinion. And that is going to involve uh, getting a preview. So it was a big part of my um, being able to run it fast um, just last week. And Tyler, of course, is very familiar with it. And so he's uh, he's out there now and we'll see how he does. Yeah, I remember even during that three day scout every day uh, or when I saw you, at least on the second day, how much you said that route is incredible. Uh, so glad to be out there seeing it. Um, I can imagine that only just made your brain more efficient. So like, OK, I know that there's a turn junction here. Or I know that we come to this. Uh, in my head, I'm thinking of a couple places where I know Gary didn't have trouble, but Gary had pacers that were that knew what to expect. So it could be like you're getting to the section near Reflection Lakes where there's a lot of little snake trails that you want to avoid and you got to stay on the route and same with Box Canyon and Sunrise. So I think it was awesome that you managed to take some time to get out there and, and do the pre-scout. And it was really cool to see just how stoked you were <laughs> and excited for the actual FKT attempt because... I don't, I don't know how, how exactly you phrased it, but you saw the trail for the first time and you were pretty stoked about it. Yeah. And I guess that's an important thing to mention too. It gave me an opportunity to really appreciate the beauty of it. And I was absolutely blown away on that three day tour. I mean, I was just, honestly, I would put it up there with anything I've ever done in the world, including UTMB, including UTMF, all of these beautiful mountain circum- circumnavigations all over the world. I honestly think the Wonderland Trail is as good or better than any of them. And so I was able to enjoy it, enjoy it on my three day tour because on Wednesday I, you know, I didn't take in the view for one second. I don't think it was <laughs> head down looking at the, uh, the five meters in front of me the whole way. So, uh, yeah, I, I was able to, you know, at least enjoy one lap around the mountain. Love it. Uh, let's get some more some some more live questions. Yeah. So I guess before we really dig into how the day played out, mm-hmm. uh, there's a question from Cheryl. Cheryl said, "Dylan, what's your motivation for doing the well, and when are we going to get more episodes?" <laughs> Good question. I've been really slacking on that recently. <laughs> um, so you know, I'm somebody who has. I was a very early adopter of podcasts. I mean, I was listening to like the Bill Simmons podcast you know, back in 2011, 2012. And it's, 
something that I've always wanted to do. And as goofy as it sounds, I'm still somebody who to this day listens to sports talk radio on a daily basis, honestly. And, you know, so I, it's something I've always enjoyed just like hearing people chat about sports. And, uh, of course, like my love and my passion is, is trail and ultra running, but I also am interested in other people uh, who have similar pursuits kind of outside of sports where they're equally committed and, uh, equally hardworking and sort of put something on the line. And that's kind of the, the sort of theme of the well, right. It's like the concept of going deep, you know, and finding that like internal energy source and, um, so for example, like I talked to a friend of mine who's a master sommelier, he's like a master of wine. And so kind of understanding the, um, the parallels between what he does in his profession, what I do as an athlete, um, a friend of mine who's a venture capitalist who also is in an incredibly competitive field and, um, you know, has big wins and big losses and dealing with those sorts of things, uh, publicly, I think, you know, it also adds a different dimension to it, but then, yeah, just like the standard ultra banter is also something I, I really enjoy. And, uh, my only regret is I didn't start it earlier. You know, I wish I would have started it five years ago when, um, there weren't so many podcasts out there, but, <laughs> um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it and, uh, it's something I do want to devote time and attention to, especially now that, uh, the wonderland is behind me. Um, so yeah, I would just say, uh, I appreciate the listen. I appreciate the support and, uh, yeah, I, I uh, will hope to have more content up there very soon. I think we have a lot of crossover listeners and stuff. People who talk about the well often in the chat room and stuff like that. Uh, we love it. We don't ever want you to stop. It's like, yeah, there's the memes, there's the jokes about, God, how many more running podcasts do we right. need? But <laughs> the reality is Dylan's is one of those that I don't think there was a single person that didn't want it. Like it was the podcast we didn't know we wanted or didn't know we <laughs> needed, but wanted. I don't know. Uh, just knowing well, your connection with sport and how much you love sport, not just running and trail, but we want to hear yeah. your hot takes. One of the, well, that was what I was going to say is one of the things I was really excited about doing with it is providing more kind of like commentary on the sport and sort of talk about things that are happening from the athlete's perspective, the results from different races as somebody who knows what it takes to like go into these big races and what a lot of these courses are like, and, you know, has relationships with a lot of the athletes already and knows what it takes to, to be successful. Um, I, yeah, that's something I'm really excited about doing with the in the future with the show. Of course, with coronavirus, that's um, been one thing that you know we really have no opportunity to talk about races because there's no races happening. But, <laughs> right. um, but yeah, you know that's that's sort of the vision for the show: talk to interesting people and and then just kind of provide more of an insider's view of of ultra running. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, I want to start digging into the to the FKT attempt because. It was incredible to witness. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be able to bring my camera to hook up with uh, uh, good buddies, Ryan Thrower and Yassine Daboon, put cameras in their hands and, and get a team out there to document this thing. So since 2015, it, we actually haven't been back to Rainier since following Gary. Uh, I think maybe right. we maybe driven near it or something at one point. But seeing Gary set the FKT in 2015 was one of those moments where you knew about Kyle Skaggs' FKT. You knew that that record was just untouchable. It was one of those numbers that people in the region were just like, it'll never be it's broken. It's going to be like a long standing. Yeah. It's going to be like the Carpenter, right? It's going to be the Pike's Peak. It's going to be these these numbers that you're dealing with that are just like, who's ever going to touch that? It was just too perfect. Um, and having Gary have that perfect day and drop that FKT was, how did this happen? Like, this this was a miracle. This was magic. Um, Gelfie went on a couple years later to then drop that time by roughly 30 minutes. I know the exact numbers in my head, but my brain isn't able to do math currently. And he um, attempted twice. I think twice. I believe he attempted it twice. The second time was actually able to drop it by 30 minutes ish. So Dylan, going into this attempt, you knew you had some pretty stout numbers ahead of you. Did you have any idea if you'd be able to get close? Did you, especially after doing your scouting mission, did you have a ballpark? of where you could be before you started or was it just, you have no idea? Yeah, I think, you know, 
I wouldn't have attempted it if I didn't feel like I had a shot to, to break the record. So I definitely felt like it was within reach. Uh, and you know, that was without any experience on the trail. And then after running the three day lap, I figured that like 17 and a half hours was possible. Um, so taking an hour off the existing course record hmm. by Ryan Gelfi. Um, I'm really not a numbers guy, so I never like do math to think like, oh, well, I could do this section this quickly than this section this quickly. And I wasn't running off pay, uh, splits or pace or anything like that. So, you know, just acknowledging that on the front end, it was more of just like an instinct thing, just as somebody who's done a lot of ultras and, you know, who did the three day lap thinking, uh, yeah, you could probably go about an hour faster on this route. So to go, um, an hour and or 30 minutes, so about 90 minutes quicker was, um, on the outer edge of what I would have expected. I definitely didn't expect to finish, uh, as quickly as I did. Um, uh, but now in retrospect, I think it can actually go quite a bit, uh, quicker, um, on the right day in the right conditions with the right athlete who's having a good day. I think it could go quite a bit quicker. Um, but yeah, you know, this is, this is how the sport works, right? Like when Kyle did it, he was a, he was a legend, right? And then Gary comes, and I mean, people didn't even attempt it for like seven or eight years after Kyle, because he was mm -hmm. such a legend. And, and then, uh, Gary came along and dropped it by two hours. And then Gelfi came along and dropped it by 30 minutes. And, um, you know, now to take another big chunk off of it, I'm sure, you know, there's somebody out there who's rubbing their hands together, who's excited about making, uh, making the attempt themselves. And, um, yeah, you know, I, I think, I had a pretty good day, you know, it certainly wasn't, uh, it wasn't perfect. And, uh, for that reason, you know, I'd love to do it again, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I think if it survives this summer, which I think is, you know, pretty unlikely as it is, um, it won't be too long before somebody goes out there with equal focus and, uh, and takes a good chunk off of it. It is interesting to talk about FKTs this summer because it, without races, without these competitive scenarios where people can really begin to push themselves or have others help push them further, that sort of thing, FKTs are obviously becoming, I don't want to say the hot thing or the, the, the thing that all the elite athletes are, are trying to take on. But in this case, I feel like I've seen more stuff happen around the, the Wonderland Trail in the last couple of months than in the five years since we, we filmed uh, Wonderland with Gary Robbins. It just seems like there's a lot of attention around it, especially up here in the Northwest. What do you feel? Uh, uh, be, because I look at your day and I'm like, what an incredible day, 90 minutes off of the previous FKT. Were there parts of that day that you feel were not optimal? Is that why you're saying that you feel that the time could go faster than that? What was not optimal about your experience? Yeah. So the first six hours or so of the day was flawless for me. I was feeling really good, taking it easy, moving quickly, well ahead of the pace. And, uh, around midday, it started getting really hot and w about halfway through. So, you know, you go through Moich Lake, which is the first point when you can see your crew and resupply, and then you have a big downhill and I think at that bottom of that big downhill, you're sort of like getting close to about halfway and you go into the hardest part of, of the course, at least in my opinion, uh, you have an enormous, roughly 6,000 foot climb. It comes in sort of a 35, a hundred foot climb. And then you drop about 15 and then you climb another 25. So you climb about 6,000 feet over the course of probably 10 or 11 miles, I would guess. And for me, it was in the middle of the day, it was getting really hot. And at that point, the, uh, the day is sort of accumulating, the stress is accumulating and then dropping into to white river, I was feeling pretty hot and, and just a little bit fatigued. And then the next section up to panhandle gap, which is really maybe the most scenic and beautiful part of the, of the whole course, I was feeling really rough. And, um, luckily, you know, I'm pretty good at moving at a fairly respectable pace, even when I'm feeling awful. And so, you know, my focus at that point was just to, uh, problem solve and, um, kind of, you know, keep, keep moving as I attended to, 
you know, a nutritional deficit and, and dehydration, which I think were the core causes of my energy failure as they usually are in ultra running. Um, so, you know, it's not unusual obviously to have like an extended low patch. I think, um, you know, running on a hot day of course is not ideal. That's one of the other reasons why I think, uh, it could go quite a bit faster on a cool, on a cool day. Um, and yeah, you know, the, the fact that I dealt with a low patch, I'm sure most people who would go for it and, uh, have an FKT would have some sort of a, a low patch and it's very rare to have kind of the perfect day. So, uh, I, pretty proud of the fact that I was able to kind of navigate it, um, you know, at least somewhat effectively and, um, yeah, then getting down to box Canyon, uh, with about 11 miles to go or so, uh, Caitlin Gervin tagged in and she was really my, my first and only pacer of the day. Uh, Yasin had covered a few miles with me earlier in the day, but just having her there to, to sort of push me that I could kind of latch onto her and, uh, um, you know, kind of use her to set the pace, uh, that really helped. And she's uh, just a, such a good attitude and, uh, such a good person and such a great athlete. I mean, I can't say enough about how impressed I am with, with Caitlin. And, um, she was able to really push me near the end to where I would have been going a lot slower at the end if, uh, she hadn't been kind of towing me along. And of course we had the motivator that we had the, uh, potential to get under 17 hours, which, you know, for us silly ultra runners is, you know, at least, uh, some kind of a, a motivator at the end of a super long day. So yeah, I just want to kind of acknowledge her. And, um, also you mentioned our, our mutual friend, Ryan thrower, uh, I want to throw him some love as well. He actually produces my podcast and you're the one who made that connection to us. And, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's become a good friend and, uh, yeah, he was out there hustling super hard on Wednesday. So we had a good team and you guys all helped me to, uh, to move quickly throughout the day. Um, but it wasn't without its low points. And, uh, you know, for that reason, you know, you always want to, you always want to go back. It's, it's so rare <laughs> that like you look back and you're just like, yep, I did it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm, I'm done now. Pop a bow on <laughs> it. That yeah. is wrapped. But um, I feel like it's worth acknowledging that like Dylan did not have pacers for the entire loop. So, I mean, that was going like, to be like, to me that adds like an extra layer of just mental fortitude, yeah. right? Like doing a solo effort. It wasn't that it was unsupported or uh, self-supported. It was just that you chose to ha to not have pacers, just do the solo shred. Is that something that you would do if you were to ever go back and ever want to like, <laughs> hey, I want to better, let's just say better my own time. So better your own time because we don't know what's going to happen. But would you take a pacing crew with you? Would you would you try that front of it? You know, that that's one thing that in retrospect, I think would have helped me go quite a bit faster. Um, I am somebody who prefers to go solo. And, um, you know, that pertains to, you know, big adventures like this and, and also in racing, mm -hmm. uh, most of the big races around the world, in fact, pretty much all the races in the world outside of North America don't allow pacers. Mm -hmm. And it's my preference, uh, to go in that style in racing. And, you know, if I would have had, you know, I did put a lot of energy into trying to find people to, to run with me during the course of the day. Um, but I think it does provide a big advantage because, uh, just thinking back of all the times that you stop and fill up your water bottle in a Creek, um, that's time that you could just keep moving and have your mm -hmm. pacer fill up your bottle for you. I mean, that's technically within the rules, you know, with these FKTs, everything's a little bit of a gray area because that like, for example, that would not be allowed at Western States. Right. Um, so um, but in FKTs, when it's technically supported, I don't think there's a rule against that. So, you know, if I were to have a second crack at it uh, and I'm really wanting to go as fast as I possibly could, that would have probably been the one thing that I would have changed. I also want to commend you, Dylan, on every time we saw you, despite you being in a low spot or maybe suffering out there from dehydration, calories, that sort of thing, not once did you actually complain. And I don't know if this is just 
a Dylan thing in general. I think Harmony <laughs> knows you better than anybody. She's able to tell exactly what state you're in by just looking looking deeply into your eyes. <laughs> Uh, but there was never, there was never a like, oh, that was the worst. You know, there was never one of those moments of, oh man, Dylan's in rough shape. From an outsider, it's just sort of like, oh shit, this guy, he feel he looks great. He's moving incredibly well. Like it was just, it seemed like a solid day all day. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I'm pretty good at just keeping a game face on at at aid stations and stuff. Um, so. And I, I've done enough of these things now to where, and I'm such a kind of like, I don't know, um, impatient person, stubborn person <laughs> to where like, I just want to keep going, you know, like I'm just, I'm not interested in the time and energy it takes to complain, you know, especially at aid stations. But if you talk to Caitlin, uh, you know, she, she's in the chat actually right now. Yeah. She, yeah, yeah. she says, uh, so, um, different story at the end of the day. <laughs> go huh? for it, okay, okay. So let me tell the story. So, <laughs> so Caitlin, like I said, tagged in with 10 or 11 miles to go. And I'm pretty much, you know, every 30 seconds, I'm looking at my watch, which is my number one bad habit. And when I'm not feeling good, I just look at my watch like every five seconds. And, also just really not feeling good and ready to be done at that point. And every 30 seconds, probably of just letting out these deep, like groans and grunts and, um, sounds of pure discomfort and, uh, unhappiness. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah, eventually that turned into kind of complaining about some pain I was having in my foot. And, um, anyway, so Caitlin was able to, uh, put me in my place at that point being the, uh, task master and uh, a <laughs> good pacer that she was. And she, uh, told me that I was suffering from a condition known as LBS, which is short for little bleep syndrome. I don't want you can to say on the show. It's okay. You can say you can it. Say it. <laughs> little bitch syndrome. Dylan. And, uh, <laughs> oh. and uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I knew in that moment that I was definitely uh, being a little bit of a crybaby. And uh, luckily I had uh, somebody there who was uh, not concerned with my feelings at that point and was more interested in getting me to the finish as quickly as possible. So I respond well to those sorts of insults. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not a, a complainer, but at aid stations, I'm usually able to kind of keep, keep my composure and just get in and out and keep going. Uh just a little, yeah, a little bit of uh, uh, some additional flourishing of this story was that Caitlin was waiting at Box Canyon to pick Dylan up, uh, arriving from this rough section post White River. So at Box Canyon, I'm looking at, at Caitlin. She's writing stuff on her arm. I'm like, what are you writing on your arm? She goes, splits. Like she basically is kind of doing the math and figuring out what Dylan needs to do pace-wise to get from Box Canyon to Reflection Lakes to the finish in sub-17. So if Dylan showed up within a certain time window, she'd be able to pick him up and just push him. Uh, but the whole time she's writing this down, she's like, I just don't want him to be an LBS. Like, I don't want him to be a little bitch and I don't want to have, you know, I'll deal with it. She is absolutely amazing at dealing with and it. And also, like, if you've ever hung out with Caitlin and Ellie in a race scenario, you've been exposed to L the LBS uh, yep. vocabulary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was amazing to see, man. And I can only imagine those miles with Caitlin were fun memorable and also probably not fun uh because you definitely definitely had to work for it um 16 hours 58 minutes 41 seconds which is about an hour and a half faster than ryan gelfie's fastest no time on the wonderland trail which is it's it's not just like when i interviewed you the day before just sort of like what's your goal and your goal was one second faster than gelfie which is yes of course it's it just has to be one second faster did you ever expect at any point during the day, 90 minutes? Was that on your radar? Yeah, to be honest, I, I almost thought I was going to be going faster than that. Um, earlier in the day when I went through Moach Lake, 50 minutes ahead of the record, at that point I kind of thought, oh, wow, like I might be chasing sunset at this point. And, uh, of course, the fatigue and miles and low points add up at a certain point. And, um yeah, I mean, like, I'm I'm happy. I finished in under 17 hours, which 
was uh, kind of a cool milestone to be the first person to do that. And um, looking back on it, it was a really fun way to kind of like spend my summer and a really fun project to devote my attention towards. And just like basically almost every race I've ever done, I still look back and think, oh man, I wish I would have done this part differently. And that's what keeps things interesting. That's what uh, makes the sport beautiful is it's just so rare to have that that perfect day. Um, and if I ever do it again, I know what I'll do differently and I'm confident I can go a good deal faster. Um, but there's a really good chance that I'll never do it again. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, the, uh, I, you know, I, you have to be satisfied with the effort that you put forward. And on Wednesday, it was the best that I had. And, um, you know, the person who breaks it, whether it's today or next week or next month or five years from now. Um, yeah, I hope they have to work for it. <laughs> you know, I hope it, I hope it's now in a position to where it's, uh, yeah, it's not going to come easy to anybody. I commend you, my friend, because you, you did something that, uh, was incredible. Uh, the Wonderland Trail is is by no means an easy jaunt in a national park. It is rugged. It is remote. It is long. Uh, and you're kind of on your own for a long period of time. A2B2 two two in the chat room also brings up a great point just in regards to like crew size. And yeah. um, we've been limited with the number or the size of any group in Washington state, obviously to uh, six or less. So even having pacers and stuff like that really limits your ability to have a crew. Like you, you, you have to be, diligent in how big your group size is at, at, at any given point with the restrictions and stuff like that. So maybe if you do end up ha having to do it again in the future, Dylan, and, and want to give it another go, we can just bring in as many pacers as you need, whoever you want. We'll make sure the weather is cool, <laughs> uh, whatever, whatever you need. But it was amazing to witness, my friend. Well, I'm so happy and honored that you get to, or that you documented it. And, uh, We'll look forward to seeing the uh, the finished product eventually. And uh, yeah, it's always an honor to be able to chat with you here on GRL. And I appreciate, I get all the time people come up to me and say, oh, I saw you on Ginger Runner Live. So it's awesome what you guys have built here with your wonderful community. And uh, it's an honor whenever I get to come on and uh, look forward to spending more time together in the future. No doubt, here my in friend. the Pacific Northwest, don't tell the Californians. <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible here. It's terrible. It's terrible. Don't don't, don't come, come here. up here. Yeah, it's terrible. Here. <laughs> uh, do you have like uh, a couple more minutes, Dylan? We can do rapid fire questions in our after show with you. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So okay. we'll have Dylan for the after yeah. show. Um, and I basically, I probably have five hours to finish the movie, uh, the Wonderland movie with Dylan, Wonderland Two. Uh, in case uh, Tyler finishes before or after, uh, we got to make sure that the movie is done so Dylan can have the FKT movie. We'll make it happen. I've got five hours to edit it. Um, a wonderful, wonderful time tonight with our, our amazing friend Dylan Bowman. Dylan, oh, also remind people where they can find you on social media, where they can go download The Well, uh, and where they can con continue to follow you and your uh, adventures to come. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Uh, so my handle is at Dylan Bow, D-Y-L-A-N-B-O. That's on Instagram and Twitter. I don't really use Facebook, uh, but I am on Strava where you can see uh, my GPS track from Wednesday. And uh, yeah, the well, thanks for the plug uh, that you can find on iTunes and all major podcast distribution platforms. And like I said, uh, I intend to have a new episode up there very soon. So I uh, appreciate anybody who uh, wants to subscribe and, and listen there too. Our guest tonight was Dylan Bowman, the current <laughs> FKT holder on the Wonderland Trail in a blazing time of 16 hours, 58 minutes and 41 seconds. Just, I mean, it was incredible. He, he one of the I coolest, fastest I yelled so loud when dudes. you phoned me. It was, was like one of somebody's one of our neighbors is going to complain or think something's wrong in our house. Yeah, it was one of those things where as soon as I got signal, I just called Kim without any context, <laughs> just said 16, 58, 41. <laughs> and your your voice just went, what? Just blew up. Because, I mean, one, going faster than 18, uh, 27 was just mind blowing. 
let alone an hour and a half faster. Um, we're going to ask some additional. Wow, that <laughs> sentence was great. Uh, we're going to ask Dylan Bowman some additional questions in our after show. If you would like to join us in our after show, it's very easy to do. Just head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner for as little as a dollar a month. You get access to all of our after shows with our guests where there's rapid fire questions and uh, we get to ask any additional questions that you might have. Um, and you get access to all of the archive versions of that as well. Kim and I are also going live every single day. We basically um, done live shows now 126 episodes since mm -hmm. the start of the pandemic. Uh, for $3 and above levels of Patreon. So if you'd like to join us for what we are calling the Daily Brew, it's our uh, daily live show over a cup of coffee or an afternoon beer, uh, we would love to have you join the crew. So head on over to patreon.com slash the ginger runner. Now, at the end of every episode, we like to recognize a member of the community in a segment that we like to call our GR crew member of the week. Uh, someone who goes above and beyond, gets out there and gets after it. Kim, who is this week's GR crew member? This week's GR Crew Member of the Week is our one and only Angela Cousier. Uh, Angela had big plans to run her first 100 miler this summer. She's going to be running Cascade Crest. And of course, with everything canceled, uh, she took part in Gretchen Walla's uh, hamster virtual run. So she essentially did small, small loops. like four point something mile loops, uh, accumulating 100 miles, achieving her first 100 miler and getting her first 100 mile buckle. So congratulations, Angela. Congratulations, Angela. It was really cool to uh, hear that you accomplished your goal, got your 100-mile buckle this weekend. Congratulations to you. Uh, that's it for today's show. That's thank you so much, everybody. Uh, episode 322 is coming to a close. A big thank you to our guest, Dylan Bowman. We are going to move right into the after show with him for just a few minutes because uh, he's got a busy afternoon probably tracking a blue dot. Um, <laughs> but regardless, we appreciate all of you so much. We hope you're getting out there training as hard as you can, virtually racing harder and partying the hardest. I know I am. We'll see you guys next week. Goodbye. Ginger Runner.